So <laughs> this episode <laughs> is on is just purely on wuxia as a genre. Um, and it's oh. been a long time coming. And I am actually so excited to do this deep dive because um, I think it's a lot of... It's like a genre that a lot of people have encountered but are not really familiar with uh, oh. is, is how I see it. Because like a lot of people, you can say like, oh yeah, I've seen kung fu films. Like everyone can say that I've seen Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Okay, not everyone, but most people. No. Um, and like every everyone has encountered little things or like Karate Kid and things like that. They're like, oh, okay, oh. like action, Asian action things. Is oh. I know this. Um, and um, but obviously it's not. Uh, it's it's a lot bigger than that. And there's a lot of like different traditions that oh. we touched on last time, uh, Yulian, in our last episode, uh, we really like talked about kind of like the history of, of Wuja's genre and then like kind of like where it, like more of where it came from and then like kind of like the basics of like the different definitions of the terminology. Um, <laughs> so yeah. if anyone you're interested in checking out um, like all of these things that we talked about already, uh, Check out our Wuxia, our old Wuxia episode because it's still very relevant and there's some like really good info that Yilin dropped. Um, but I feel like uh, we kind of want to talk about like Wuxia right now, right? Like especially with like uh, Shang Chi and like all of these um, different things that are still coming out. Um, like it's it's such a cool genre that I think will continue to manifest, I mean, definitely in China, <laughs> but also I think in Western media as well. So well, I, I want to like dive more into like where the genre is going. So um, actually, Agatha, before we get too much into that, yeah, I, I'm, I know I'm all elbows here, but like, I gotta say, first of all, Elin, that episode is one of my favorites for the entire like, Thank it, you. it was such a good that dive into it and everyone everyone was just so passionate and just like great mm. information mm. um i also wanted to mention that i listened to that particular episode a lot on spotify and i know mm. that a lot of folks uh have been missing out on these episodes so some folks might be listening to this on youtube or watching it on youtube mm. uh but if you're listening on spotify i wanted to let you know that this is actually because of some feedback we got from our patrons we, of course, really, really appreciate who support the show and allow us to make decisions and play around with our format in a way that is maintainable and sustainable for all of the cast and crew here. So for all the patrons out there, thank you so much. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or on your podcast feed, um, you probably noticed that we released 10 episodes uh, kind of in batch. And the plan moving forward will be to release our episodes in batch each season or so about 10 or so at a time just so that our content and our conversations are as accessible as possible to our audience so to all our listeners out there thank you so much agatha sorry for interrupting you no 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 this is great um and yeah so for this episode um we <laughs> we are we have you in back which is amazing and then we have one more uh guest to to really help bring the knowledge to us uh joyce so uh, i i want uh you know why don't you introduce yourself to um to the listeners and the audience yeah who are you Hi. what do you do why are you awesome hi everyone um i'm so happy to be back thank you for having me and um i'm a writer um poet um i translate from chinese um and sometimes I do consultations as well for publishers and for games on sensitivity and representation. And um, during my master's, I spent a lot of time researching wuxia. And that's when I became really kind of um, interested in the genre. And I spent time traveling in um, mainland China and in Hong Kong, visiting a lot of wuxia sites, um, as well as kind of doing book research and reading about it and writing about the history of the genre. Um, so I find it a really fascinating topic and I'm really excited to dive in here. Sweet, thank you. And what about you, Joyce? Hi, I'm Joyce. I am happy to be here as well. I am from Singapore. I'm based in Singapore at the moment. And uh, I write science fiction uh, and fantasy. I also write 
young adult fiction, and I also dabble or write in RPGs. And I'm one of the writers for Hearts of Moving. Very nice. Yeah, I I remember reading the stuff that you wrote um, in Hearts of Lee. I I remember at first reading it and being like, "Whoa, whoa, this person really knows, <laughs> like, really knows the genre." And then I went back and then because it was all in text, and I was like, "Oh right, this is a section written by this Joyce person." <laughs> Joyce person. <laughs> <laughs> like, it makes sense that they, they brought someone else uh, to like talk about all of the cultural mm -hmm. context and things like that and mm -hmm. I think that really helped the game um, mm -hmm. and is another part of why I think mm -hmm. um, there were some really cool things if you want to mm -hmm. check out like playing a game that is wuxia, wuxia. tabletop mm -hmm. role playing game check out Hearts of Balloon because Joyce's stuff is in there so yeah, I, I was Sorry. consulting for that. So I also read Joyce's yeah. <laughs> writing as well. It was good. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, right? We all, all, yeah. we all worked on it. So, so I, yay, as a <laughs> I actually played the game. I played the game as well with um, Cat Rainbow and the rest. We played a, we live stream a couple of games um, for House of Woolen as well. So I kind of know the game in a way so it's like oh yeah. that's and very that's interesting cool. oh now it's I'm really fun. curious about picking your, <laughs> it's quite fun. picking your brain about like um how you think the mechanics translate uh the genre but first mm -hmm. let's uh let's kind of like i kind of want to give a little bit of a primer to the genre first so like Maybe like let's talk about how Wuxia has evolved as a genre throughout the years. Like, I think what I'm the most curious about is like what are the trends and themes that you see in Wuxia that is the most exciting to you. So like whatever is relevant, you feel like is relevant now. Well, you didn't can stop. <laughs> are you sure? Um, yeah. Oh, join. <laughs> <laughs> That's such an interesting question because I feel like there's so much going on in the genre. Um, you know, like historically, um, when we had the different waves of wuxia, which I think I mentioned a little bit last time, and how that has evolved. And to now, like, um, recently I've been watching a lot of wuxia dramas recently and some xianxia adaptations as well. You know, mm -hmm. like looking at some of the classics again, like Legend mm -hmm. of Contra Heroes, Romance mm -hmm. of Contra Heroes, and so on. Um, but also looking at how like writers in the West and also, mm -hmm. you know, movies like Sanchi have mm -hmm. been playing with some of the same tropes. So I find mm -hmm. that really interesting. That's something I've noticed, I think over the last few years is that um, it's become more well known. I feel like mm -hmm. outside of China and in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, even more compared to before. And, and uh, as that happens, I think we are seeing kind of maybe new themes and different approaches pop up and people connect to different things. Um, I'm really also excited by the Dame that came out as well, um, especially in terms of adaptations and again, reaching like a wider audience. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, with the, with the situation in China now, I don't know if we'll see more of it. But that's something that really excites me as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, can you explain briefly what Danme is? Yeah, so Danme is basically like boys' love and like Lily, um, like by her stories, which mm -hmm. is featuring like romantic relationships, um, oftentimes for like a female audience. And generally, it's kind of male characters in like a romantic relationship. So yeah. it's, um, it's like yeah. same gender uh, romances. That's right. In a way, it's like slash, but not slash. It's um in the in Japanese, it's like shonen ai or yaoi. So it's kind of like that too. But I think Danme is more elegant in a way. That's what I thought. With the stories. Like the untamed, or um, in Chinese, is Modao Zhu Shi, which is like um, grandmaster of demonic cultivation. So I'm, I mean, the people in the West know it as the untamed, but 
I think this is where people started to get interested in wuxia or xianxia, which is cultivation. Um, yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah. I've noticed that uh, oh. there se- there does seem to be a lot more like mainstream, um, oh. like danme, um, oh. uh, drama specifically, and oh. I I think it's really interesting, Joyce, that you said that it's more like an elegant thing. Like that's kind of like it's, it's more it's <laughs> understated, right? Because oh. and I feel like this is be- partly because of all of the um, uh, oh, what's the word? censorship laws like you're not allowed oh. to really show it you're only allowed to hint at it in china so in china, like yeah. in order to get it on screen like some of oh. that is it seems like it's a require like you just have to edit it that way um oh. but it also then becomes like kind of a, a genre, like of definition of the genre i guess yes i feel that like in if you bring in the wuxia expert, they are xia and they are supposed to be like gentlemen. So they are brought up to behave like gentlemen. Therefore, they are refined. They are very polite. And when they speak, it's refined, very um, understated. And it's all conveyed via their yeah, um, expressions, their yeah, body language. Um, that's how I see uh, Danme and Xianxia, it's very all intertwined. They are behaving like gentlemen. Yeah. Xia, so, and they behave, yeah. um, unlike the brash, like the Western way, they are more refined. They, they will play their, their guchen or shitsa or play their flute, but they will not indulge in garish actions just to show that they care. But it's right understated and it, I think it's as I say, elegant. So. Yeah, they're following like a, you know, like a rule of conduct and mm. etiquette, you know, mm. in these stories, because it is kind of rooted in that kind of cultural value. Mm. And yeah. so we see that kind of carried over in the sea mm. dramas and in the mm. writing and in the world building, you know, how, how characters mm. behave, they're following the code of like the dreams, you know, the gentle person, gentleman. Jinzi. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not supposed to kind of do certain things in <laughs> that kind of code of ethics, you know? Mm-hmm. So so it's not just like a straight up warrior. Like there's certain kind of rules of behavior as well mm-hmm. attached to that, um, mm-hmm. that require you to be more refined and to know mm-hmm. poetry and to be to play music and to behave in like polite ways and to like mm-hmm. stay true to your promises and all of that, you know? Mm-hmm. So. So that also is definitely kind of embedded within that world. Mm. And we see that carried over, I think, into the dame. Do you feel like these kind of like, because I feel like, uh, I mean, like even in older wuxia stories, like the classics, if you will, like, Mm. well, if we're talking about like Jinyo and also, um, uh, yeah, mm. if we're talking about those, like there are a lot of main characters mm. that are not necessarily subscribing to this kind of like um, code of conduct, if you will. Like, for example, in Lu Dingji, right? Like, that's very mm. clearly like a story where the main character is the opposite of like what you would uh, expect. So, like, there, like older wuxia stories are already kind of interrogating this kind of uh, like mm. what is like what makes a person. Um, I guess a xia or like mm. what kind of a person is deserving of being the main character uh, so mm. like do you think that that's a thing that is still happening now like with stories like are stories still being like what is a xia like or is it kind of like oh we're past that like anyone can be a xia sort of but this is just like that code of conduct is just something that everyone understands is a thing I I think Lu Dingqi is often talked mm. about as like an anti wuxia novel in a way, mm. and Jing Wang was very much aware of that when he wrote mm. it. You know, he would tip, basically set out to wrote to write something that was like very different mm. and very like not following those kinds of rules, mm. and and it was his last novel. You know, and he stopped writing wuxia after that and kind of was like, I'm I'm done with the genre. Um, mm. And it's kind of like you, he took on a much more um, 
critical, you know, take of the genre in that particular book. And mm -hmm. I think now what we're seeing is, I think the the current um, representation of of Sha, it's kind of shift the the waves and the interest have shifted because I see mm -hmm. now like a lot more focus on the Xianxia aspects mm -hmm. in the current day as opposed to mm -hmm. straight up Wuxia. Mm -hmm. And Xianxia tends to be a lot more interested in cultivation and in Xian. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind mm -hmm. of the the system and the values of the Xia in a way has kind of become weaker and I think less present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also maybe because of the censorship as well. Um, I mm -hmm. think writers are less likely to go into those kind of political topics in terms yeah. of the historical, you know, way that the Shao was kind of um, seen as opposing these kind of institutional forces. And yeah, they're supposed to be the underdog and uh, supposed to yeah. fight for the weak, to protect the widow, the children, the vulnerable. So they are like, they're actually re rebelling against the norm and if you if if you read a lot of the uh, historical uh, texts and literature, they are like anti-government. Yeah, mean, yeah. They are big on anti-government, so it's like yeah, and which is yeah, so, and, yeah, and you, things you, have shifted also, as well. So yeah, mm. no, but in China it? now with the censorship, so they um the creators have to tread very carefully how to portray. Uh, Xia or Xianxia or even characters as well because they are navigating a very very messy ocean with my views yeah yeah so we see yeah. shifts to you know different kinds of focus like romance or other kinds of topics mm. rather than kind of interrogating that particular mm. concept mm. yeah Steve you look like you have thoughts I don't know a whole lot about Usha, uh, <laughs> but I know what I like. And I know when I am looking at a piece of media that tries to be closer to these kind of like traditional stereotypes and themes and tropes and whatnot. Mm. So like my my modern examples would be some scenes in Shang-Chi, but also mm. Shadow is probably my, my the closest thing mm. I have to something that's modern that I can really resonate with and that mm. I could... I could have subtitles with, uh, <laughs> but um, these ideas just really, really um, resonate with me. And I just find mm -hmm. the conversation so, so interesting. Mm -hmm. The main takeaway I'm getting from this is that Shadow and Shang-Chi, they like scratch the surface as to what the genre has to offer. Mm -hmm. I love that our topic is like, is it still relevant? And already in this conversation, I, I know what my answer is because what you've described to me is just a whole wealth of mm. potential stories that I could enjoy and engage with. Mm. Yeah, um, I see from uh, the comments, there's a question uh, asked uh, by Mahar, uh, our own Mahar, one of our mods, um, and uh, specifically about like, e like erasure of queer content. Um, and like, it's kind of like, I, I feel like this is a th thing that is that always comes up as controversy as like oh. is is con, con, is media like the untamed like queer baiting um that's oh. not specifically what uh, mahar said but oh. i i feel like that is in the spirit of the question where there's like a lot of i mean but there's i feel like this might be a different topic altogether because oh. there's just so much of it coming from china right now like all of these oh. like Dan made these like boys love type dramas mm. where they're like a lot of times they're like really like really hinting at it but then in the end because of censorship uh then it's like ugh, we're best bros um and it's very like it's so much so that it becomes like online jokes uh where people would mm. talk like joke about like oh yes we're, like these two people such good bros but it's like like we we know we know that that's you know. not what it was hinted and oh. um and how like i feel like the, the question is like how do we feel about this like erasure of actual queerness and i 
I, I can give my opinion first, which is that I don't like it, but I also feel like the content creators can't really do anything about it because in oh. order, again, to get to their content out there, there's the censorship. And censorship in China is just, like, you can't, you can't really fight against it because if you do, then you just get taken, like, you just get taken off air and it's really mm. hard to fight, find it. So it's like, mm. is it the creator's fault? I, I don't, like, I'm not sure. Like, I don't know. What do you think, Eileen? It's definitely not the creator's fault in a situation where, you know, it's really result of policy and institutions. Mm. Um but yeah, obviously I don't like it either. I would love to see more direct queer representation and I look for it. And I am always asking as well, friends I know, other translators um, and mm -hmm. writers in um, different kind of Sino diaspora parts of Asia and in you know Taiwan and Hong Kong, I ask mm -hmm. folks and mm -hmm. it's, it's really tricky because it's just, um, most of the wuxia is still coming out of China, and mm -hmm. it's just creators are really, really kind of not being able to um, write queer content in the way that maybe they want to. Mm -hmm. And the situation has gotten a lot worse, I would say, um, because of things going on. And mm -hmm. um, I hear about, you know, kind of the struggles that queer organizations and nonprofits are yeah. facing in China. Um, so, so we're definitely seeing that on all levels, not just in media. So you have to understand that's the environment that they're creating in and, mm. and what do you do? Right. So, um, I would ideally like to see just a much wider range of representation mm. because, you know, um, it's important to have it directly on screen, like not just queer baiting. Um, mm. and for folks who don't know, I'm also like, on the asexual and aromantic spectrum. So at the same time, I also want to see maybe queer, pl queer, pl queer pl platonic, you know, relationships mm. as well being depicted. So I don't mm. necessarily want people to read it as queer baiting if it's actually meant to be queer platonic, you know, like. Um, so I think it's really important to have just a wider, a wider range. And I mean, it would it would be nice to have that, but what can we? do in this kind of um, environment, I guess. Uh, environment yeah. is quite um, tricky and I can say downright toxic, but yeah, and then and elaborating um, Asia itself, I mean, especially East Asia, Southeast Asia, even like um, West Asia or South Asia, I mean, having LGBT queer representation is, uh, <laughs> uphill fight most of the time. And a lot of the queer creators do feel, do experience censorship a lot. And uh, it's, and for the Chinese um, queer creators to try to bring their, their uh, content forward without offending anyone, it's, uh, it's a minefield as well, so it's not easy for them. It's not easy for, for, for a lot of people here. So I can understand, too. Yeah. but I, we can fight against draconian policies. So I think what they're doing is very brave, very subversive in a way. And they know that their content is being now being read and watched by, and listened to by, by the larger, like, larger world by the Chinese diaspora in the West. So people do know and they know. But as I said, we, we a lot of us are being constrained by policies which which are out of our, our control. So this is, sad, this is a sad part. So yeah, I'm mm. echoing Joyce that is mm. a very brave thing to do to try to push back against that even mm. in very subtle ways. And mm. I do hear stories of that, and I see examples of that. Mm. Um, recently, I was watching a review of a damage show. The name mm. I have forgotten now, but um, the the show had been dubbed over, and mm. originally um, the dialogue was very like straight up like um, homosexual romance, and mm. um, 
it, you can tell based on the the acting and the way that the most of the actors move that mm -hmm. it was dubbed over and lines have been changed mm -hmm. but they still you know like released it with the the original acting and the dubbing and mm -hmm. kind of fans were creative in watching that and trying to actually like lip read and they mm -hmm. were able to kind of try to decipher what was actually said and people released like real like newer versions of the same show was uh, kind of redubbed again based on what they could kind of make out of the the lip reading so so they're really trying very hard to find ways to be creative despite that kind of environment and and that's just kind of you know they're trying their best i think very very best they're trying the hardest actually i yes. am I'm personally really happy that we're having this conversation in a very positive but very realistic way um, because I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of queer baiting versus queer coding versus not erasing a row in other uh, platonic relationships. There's a lot more nuance on it. I don't think we'll have the space necessarily to talk about it in detail, but I do want to just shout out that this conversation I think is really, really important and I cannot wait to be part of more conversations like this. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm gushing. Yeah. I'm gushing. I'm starstruck. I love this conversation. <laughs> we need to have more. I mean, we need to confront this because um, for half the world uh, outside North America, we are faced with this issue where um, present, even creating something queer coded is difficult. Um, I mean, our books with young adult, um, young adult books, right? I know with queer, queer content are censored, they have, to be, they have to be rewritten just to be on the shelves. So it's like, do them if you do and them if you don't. Yeah. What can the cre creator do? What can the queer creator do? Yeah. Right. And, and that's the thing, right? Because also people want this content. And I feel like that's a part of what is um hopeful i think for me is that like like you mentioned like all these fans are like they're really <laughs> they're really starved i think in a way for the content um that oh. they want so like there's always that driving force of like the creators know that in some way like if they can get it out there that there is an audience that wants it um oh. and is and will consume it and will try hard so i feel like sometimes it like a lot of people feel like they're like in this together and like trying to all get the the, the kind of content that they want uh but that also reminds me like do you feel like i feel like um from what i've noticed i mean obviously be, like when it's like a drama or a movie those are just there's just so much more cost associated with it so i guess like sometimes they're also more careful in terms of the kind of content they put out because there's just like the opportunity cost is just greater. Um, so mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of really interesting themes are being explored specifically in web novels. Um, maybe I'm biased because I also love reading web novels, but I, I feel like, like that is where I'm reading a, about a lot of really interesting topics within the genre of like wuxia or xianxia uh, like like all of these meditations on um on power <laughs> on on humanity like what is my right as a person like i think this is especially in like xianxia stories where it's like once you get so powerful that you can just like wave your hand and then and and crush a mountain then it's like what it, what is the value of human life and things like that? I think those, I mean, some of the, the stories are much more just like shown in anime where it's like, level up, oh. level up, get good things, um, cultivate. Uh, but like some oh. of those are really interesting. So do y'all do feel like there's like uh, different types of stories being told in different f uh, media, different formats? Like, so in games and shows, movies and web novels, like, I, think that, I, I feel as if there's some cross-genre 
cross fertilization going on. I mean, you can't sometimes just, it's not strictly historical, it's also fantasy, then it's also science, yeah, then it's also 2020, which is like, and it's all together, and it's like, why not all? <laughs> I mean, that I can, the gif, why not both? Like, it's like, it's, I mean, the thing is about science that is so fluid and how we portray it so fluid. So, I mean, creators can have the, the expansiveness to, and diversity to create not just one thing, but many in one. It's just like, it's like meeting. It's just like everything interwoven into one. So it's, it's not just wet models. I think they're exploring a lot of things on many levels and I mean, creators are also asking questions. And I think the fans and readers and the audience see that, they, they know that, and they want more, I think. Yeah. Eileen? Yeah, I think just adding to that, we also see a lot of kind of cross influence from, you know, games and books and, and film. Like, for example, mm -hmm. like, you know, like um, games, have also been adapted into C dramas mm. and they do well. Mm. Like one of the mm. big Xianxia um, yeah. came about because the because it was originally like a Xianxia computer game that became mm. really, really popular and it was mm. adapted. So we'll see those kind of things or maybe like a um, an IP that does really well as an adaptation um, will later become like a game, you know? So mm. I think we see the the generous kind of really melding together in a lot of mm. ways mm. um i think probably on the fiction and web novel side we do see maybe a little bit more freedom in terms of what's mm. being explored like i guess mm. i was saying i think compared to adaptations just because adaptations are getting you know streamed or kind of put online or you know they mm. have to air on tv and there is mm. even more i think level of scrutiny that's put mm. on it and mm. so so things will maybe get lost whereas maybe in the writing there will be mm. more that you can mm. slip in mm. um and and games i think added a whole nother dimension to it um mm. because you have to you know think about player like interaction with the game so mm. so what gets highlighted and you know how can we make it playable and mm. um, i find that really interesting as well kind of seeing how like like I grew up with all those RPG, like Wuxia games, like yeah. single player. I don't know if either of you have played or or Steve, I, I don't know if you've played. played specific but, yeah. one that I don't remember the name of, but left for Dynasty, Dynasty Warriors is one. Dynasty Warriors is one. So it's like- Interesting. Like, Dynasty Warriors is a Wuxia story? Is it a Wuxia game? I think I it falls within that. that category. Yeah. Interesting. To me, it falls within that category of Wuxia slash like epic, kingdom drama slash a lot of things because you do see uh Kung Fu being sure yeah like Liu Bei and okay and it, it definitely tries, in my opinion, to really it like tries. draw that like mm. aesthetic and like allude mm. to it. I think that's a mm. great example of maybe like cross genre kind of interpretations mm. there because you know I had roommates who love Dynasty Warriors and, mm. you know, they're like, watch me kill a bunch of soldiers. And I'm like, mm. you know, that's one theme, but we can definitely lean into. And yeah, it can be really fun in like a video game setting, but mm. that on its own is, I don't mm. think, emblematic of Wuxia, much mm. to maybe tension around people who mm. think they might know that this particular genre in the West. Mm. Mm. Uh, I was going to add that, you know, in a lot of games that tout themselves to be able to be cross- genre oftentimes mm. they might say that you know they do support like wuxia stories mm. and i usually have a little bit of tension around that where mm. i think the way you've described wuxia mm. has kind of shown that you have this like very surface level thinking which mm. that's fine like you not everyone knows everything but mm. to tout it as you know this like yes you can definitely do it and not dig any deeper i think is a, a very big missed mm. opportunity for mm. these larger games mm. yeah i feel like mm. whenever i think of wuxia in games i do think of the single player type games like mm. well i guess it's is it xianxia because like i think of mm. um 
Oh, I don't know what any of those things are called in English. Uh, like Xuanyuanjian and like things mm. like that. That seems more like Xianxia, where it's very like, whoa, like it's. I guess a comparison can kind of be like, no, never mind. I was gonna say like King Arthur, but that's not how it is. But it's like you know, there's like a weapon that's like that's the name of the game the series is mm. like this very powerful weapon, and then. Mm. A, a boy gets the weapon and then gets good and also gets other um uh it's kind of like jrpg i guess like other group members and then there's like a lot of romance uh, that happens i i feel like and and then i think of all of the mmo rpgs that um have come up and died <laughs> uh in my within my formative years like i used to see them all the time in like local 7-elevens when i was still living in taiwan which is just like a corner store but it has everything mm. uh, including a lot of like really cheap um i guess bundles that you can or they're like they're they basically come in these little packs um where you can buy them for very cheap and then you get like a cool like outfit in, in this one mmo and like various things and they were all kind of like the aesthetically like xianxia mm -hmm. um, right like where there's like elements of like asian-esque clothing but then there's always magic as well so mm -hmm. i don't I mean, know like, like i don't know if it should, it's strictly xianxia but it's magic and there's wuxia so that <laughs> in my mind yeah. i'm like xianxia i mean there's yeah. something there's a the, 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 now that there's a game called genshin impact which is right. also very, very, very close to Xia Xianxia, the kind of magic with, with fighting and stuff, and people just kind of enjoy it because it's, I mean, so it's very So would you broad. define it as Wuxia or Xianxia? Would you define Genshin Impact? Genshin Impact to me is more Xianxia to me okay. because you need to cultivate and they need to cultivate own, own magic or energy just to level up and power up so okay that's very sincere but to me Xianxia and Wuxia is very interlinked so that's in my own opinion yeah so I think it's, it's like, once you have cultivation and once mm, you have like non-human mm, people being <laughs> um mm, then we're we're getting into that kind of territory Xianxia. so oh oh that's so, so interesting mm, so like are you talking about like if like other like if beasts then cultivate and then take on human forms is that what you meant or or humans become immortal you know oh, like right, right? yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry. <laughs> or, or like yao guai or you know like yeah. yao <laughs> or, or like you know you, you go to hell you go to heaven like you know you leave the human world like that yeah. kind of or, yeah. or like dragons you know or whatever Drake. magical creatures I don't know, um, right. show up. Um, mm. That that would definitely not be Wuxia, right? I think we can we can probably it's, agree that it's kind like, of like we, Wuxia doesn't have like those magical like creatures or or non-human people <laughs> in that generally. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, but I haven't played Genshin, so I don't know. Yeah, I haven't either. Uh, my my kids play there. Genshin, so they're quite big on Genshin. So okay, it's very, to me, it's very Sensia ish with fantasy mm. and stuff. So it's like, yeah. Maybe I should so. play it for research. <laughs> I'll play for research. And I next should thing play you know. for research too. <laughs> it, it is very popular. So, very have you popular. played it, Steve? Uh, no, but. You know, Genshin Impact art shows up on my timeline all the time. Uh, so that's a, that's an indicator that people are really, really in love with it. You don't make art about something unless you really, really love it, right? Oh, okay. True. Like, actually, there's some really interesting comments uh, going on in the chat where it's talking about, like, there's a difference in between, like, Xuanhuan and Qihuan and Xianxia yeah. as well, which I think is actually yeah. very fair. Like, Xuanhuan yeah. is just, like... Anything that has like a mystical, magical um, mm. t flavor to the story, or mm. not flavor, like elements to the story. Mm. And it's, 
Yeah, I feel like maybe that's more accurate than Shisha. Because Shisha, actually, now that I thought about it, is a very specific kind of genre where it's a lot of... Like, there are tropes that you would associate with Shisha. Just like there are tropes that you would associate with... If if I were to say this is a Wuxia story, people would expect Mm -hmm. certain tropes. Just like with Shisha, people would expect certain tropes. Do either Mm -hmm. one of you want to, like, talk about, just briefly, like, what we mean when we say Shisha as a genre? I did a whole um, thread actually defining some of these fantasy genre terms that has been pretty popular on Twitter. And so I've mm. defined terms like Shanghuan and mm. Qifan before. So, yeah. so if I, I could clarify here for mm. folks, I think maybe it might be helpful. Mm. When we use Qihuan, generally that's just fantasy. So mm. like that's kind of the Chinese term for fantasy. Mm. It's fairly new because fantasy as a concept is kind of strange. Um, in historically in Chinese literature because mm. genre divides weren't very clear. Mm. Um, when we say xuan huan, we're, we have the word xuan in it, right? So, mm. so that's kind of referring to like a sub-genre of fantasy where it mm. has elements of like Chinese mysticism. So things like the occult, mm. you know, things like, like magical elements of like Chinese mm. folklore and mythology mm. that we associate with kind of the maybe spiritual beliefs mm. Um, mm. of like Buddhism, Taoism, or like feng mm. shui and like that kind of stuff. Mm. So like you wouldn't use the word Xianghuan to describe like a Western fantasy, mm. but like Xi Huan would be for everything. So like mm. Lord of the Rings would also fall under that. Qihuan. Yeah. Mm. It is it's more neutral. Mm. And the Xianxia, like we were saying, you know, like that's it's related to Wuxia, right? So we have mm. the Xia in there, even mm. though maybe it's it's kind of weaker now in mm. in some representation, but mm. it's still kind of influenced by that. And then we have the Xian, which is you know cultivation. So, mm. so if it's not about Xian and cultivation, it's just magical, then it might not fall under Xianxia, depending yeah. on how we kind of draw the draw the draw the line. Mm. Yeah. yeah so so i don't know the games that you're referring to like how would you describe it i guess it's yeah, just I feel very like... very the lines are blurred <laughs> right yeah that's fair i feel like for me mm-hmm. when someone mm-hmm. says this is a xianxia story to me or when mm-hmm. i read uh, a description of something and it says xianxia then i expect like certain things i expect cultivation for sure and like there i expect some kind of variation on like cultivation which is like all through the different elements and then you can like pull in the mm-hmm. the energy from the air to use that to like upgrade yourself upgrade your body upgrade different this is where the variations can come in where there's like different mm. aspects to mm. like what you can cultivate and what you can upgrade but cultivation mm. for sure um usually um i would expect there to be treasures <laughs> to be found um either like not necessarily ones gotten by the main character though the ones that i read seem to have that as a mm. common theme but like there's also like special realms that would open up for you to go in either Mm. to get like to like see if you're good enough and then you might die or to like get treasures (laughs) it always goes back to the loot i guess which is why i feel like it there are some like i feel like shinsha really started off as a very much like an entertainment sort of genre the way that like for example like shonen anime is Mm -hmm. which i find really interesting too where it's like a lot of it or a lot of the ones that are popular are it's like it's to it's like a a cool story for you to kind of like imagine yourself in more than necessarily like a like an interrogation of like themes i mean those things Mm -hmm. can come up for sure and do get incorporated and i feel like like sort of some of the older wish out stories are also kind of like definitely more like they're sorry, really to be my entertaining youngest. right like <laughs> sorry my youngest just came in oh. <laughs> sorry it just is no it's fine Bye. but yeah like what do y'all think like am i am i very limited in my idea of what xinxia is um i think it might be a little bit helpful for defining the genre to know a little bit about the history. So mm. just very briefly, uh, 
I think the earliest roots that Shansha draws on um, would be, I've talked before about and written about like kind of Tang Dynasty folk tales, like Tang Shanxi, yeah. like the, the kind of the mythical tales uh, mm. or kind of legends of, of the Tang Dynasty uh, that inspired a lot of later um, supernatural stories and eventually mm. um, wuxia. And within those tales and other tales from kind of ancient um, and kind of Middle Ages China, um, mm -hmm. we had some stories where we have kind of these Taoists who mm -hmm. kind of were able to, you know, fly and, and cultivate it and kind of mm -hmm. wander around the human world and did things and like kind of had like temples and mountains, you know, where they mm. meditated and mm. had like elixirs. And you, you can hear bits here, right? Of, mm. In this description of kind of traits that we see in Shansha. Mm. So, mm. so I would say like, I would be looking for that kind of influence. You know, do we see mm. kind of those kinds of world building elements and those kinds of character tropes mm. um, in the story? That would be something that I would kind of expect as a, mm. uh, as a reader when I hear something in Shansha. Um, mm -hmm. An echo of that, and mm -hmm. and the first kind of Shansha novel we had um, was like the Legend of Legend of Su. I think it's the English name. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But in Chinese, it's Su San Jian Sha So it was like yeah. So it was like these swordsmen, you know, from mm -hmm. from like um, the Su Mountains in Sichuan, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was like this episodic novel. Um, written a couple of decades before Jin Yong, actually, I think. So mm -hmm. a little bit earlier, but kind of that generation where he wrote actually like all these people, all these again, Taoists and people who were trying to become mm -hmm. Xian, you know? So mm -hmm. it was kind of these humans who were trying to gain immortality and trying mm -hmm. to kind of cultivate. And you will again, have these kind of descriptions of people flying on swords and kind of these kind of schools of Taoism and mm -hmm. like these mythical mountains and kind of their relationships and what mm -hmm. they did and kind of them going on their quests and that kind of stuff and adventures. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so that being kind of what inspired the genre to form, I mm -hmm. think that's kind of part of the defining, some of the defining traits mm -hmm. that we still see. Joyce, do you want to add anything? Uh, I don't want to, no, I'm still thinking. <laughs> I'm still thinking. I think because I think um I'm I'm just thinking about journey to the West, C O T, and C O T to me is is it Xianxia or 20? I would call it. I think I would call it like Xiang. I think it would be more mm -hmm. the influence for Xiang Huan. Xiang Huan, yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. as I was saying, kind of Xiang Huan was like more kind of like like kind of Chinese style fantasy, right? So. Mm -hmm. So I would see that as being influenced by things like Journey to the West mm -hmm. or like the water margin, like Sui Hu mm -hmm. or like um, what, uh, like some of the other ones about gods and stuff, like Niwa, mm -hmm. like those kind of, mm -hmm. like, and like the the mythical kind Chinese of creation law, folk like, mythology yeah. around creation and all mm -hmm. those kind of, um, but, but there's some overlap, I think, especially mm -hmm. now in terms mm -hmm. of melding of genres mm -hmm. but i think it's kind of slightly different roots kind mm -hmm. of that yeah so like mm -hmm. yeah journey to the west i think is like more fantasy more yeah. fantasy than Shansha. Mm -hmm. yeah and i feel like mm -hmm. the theme like I, I think what roots Shansha's stories is definitely like the desire like it's if it's in the background or in the foreground there is always the theme of like humans trying to ascend um, from humanhood uh, by cultivating. Mm. And then so like some of the stories that I've read are very like romance focused and then some of the, oh. and or like just relationship focused where it's a lot about like uh, revenge uh, because you killed my family and then I'm going to kill your teacher. Um, you know, like things mm. like that, which is in my opinion also very wuxia. Um, which it's always about like the the humanness of and like the obligations and like emotions. Um, yeah, but, but I think yeah. like Xianxia to me, aside from all those trappings and loot, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I feel like I'm very drawn by, <laughs> um, there is definitely that like kind of like how like I'm walking this very narrow path to like ascend, oh. um, and then like 
I'm curious. Um, you mean like did the original, like the older stories, also have the thing about like thunder? Um, when you like uh, try to ascend, and then you I think there down. were some descriptions oh. of kind of how the heaven and the sky can interact. It and some of that I think probably borrowed from mythology too. Right. <laughs> and um, say so hi like, to Natasha, yeah. everyone. <laughs> Hello. <Hi -ish. laughs> She just went yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. think we do see some of that. I would say kind of contemporary Shanxi. I haven't read too much of it. Um, I'm more familiar on the with the Wuxia side, but mm -hmm. but I think it's kind of the world building has developed more in terms yeah. of the levels of cultivation and all of that. Mm -hmm. But but the general qualities around you know reincarnation, around wanting to ascend, mm -hmm. around kind of magical objects, around flying, around like the aesthetics of the Xi'an, mm. you know, how they're like mm. flying atop of swords and these mm. kind of mountains and kind of the wilderness and kind of being like a hermit, you know, in the mountains mm. and like, and kind of isolating yourself to kind of to kind of transcend. I think a mm. lot of those are kind of classic kind of right. qualities. Yes. So I don't know. Um, I feel like maybe like I kind of want to talk about Wuxia in the West and how has the genre been interpreted in the West? And then how that interpretation, like, has it influenced, like, Chinese wuxia in turn? But I also feel like maybe mm -hmm. maybe that's, like, too narrow. And then I'm also curious, because I'm also curious about, Joyce, like, what you see um, as, like, East Asian or, like, Southeast Asian. Like, other, mm -hmm. just places outside of China that are interpreting mm -hmm. the genre. Like, is there, a, is, are there certain elements that get picked up um and yeah. emphasized i i i for me when i i grew up watching a lot of hong kong Russia, like kung fu movies and as well as taiwan taiwanese movies as well so it, it, and hong kong and taiwan is also pulling a lot of like ideas from china itself like and it's I feel as if they're both off in a way influencing one another. Right. And when I grew up and I, I see certain tropes, like same thing, like because I we 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 got to know, we got to read and watch things like um a lot of things uh, by uh Jin Yong, um like Legends of Condor Heroes. And Legend of Condor Heroes have been done, redone and retold so many times. Yeah. And because people love them so much, the stories are just so far-reaching and so influential. And growing up, I, I kind of, because uh, Singapore is majority in Chinese. So, and I can't say much for my generation, it's just a Gen X generation, but the, the after-war generation, the boomers, they still get their, like a lot of their information from Taiwan and China and what we get when we grew up around that time, they grew up just stories from China, like later. Um, there's this uh well-known oral storyteller teller called Lei Dai So. Uh and it's in Cantonese Lei Dai So. And he he will talk about he will he will tell stories about like Jingong stories orally. And it's like and I feel as if that we get people from in Southeast Asia, uh, Chinese in the Chinese in Southeast Asia, we get the main ideas, the, the, some of the main ideas from China, and somehow or rather we also get ideas from Hong Kong and Taiwan, and we kind of we in a way we move them together and think that it's the same is Wuxia, is Kung Fu. Uh, or essentia, and then we, and we accept it. And now, for now, the current trend I'm seeing, especially in Singapore, in Singapore and Malaysia, are younger folk who are really inventing wuxia and essentia by interweaving um, mythology from this area, Southeast Asia. Ooh. So it's becoming more and more uh, interesting. Like there's a story by, um, I'm not sure about who, but there's a story, it's, uh, I think I mentioned it on Twitter, it's 
what what they call or she called the writer called um Paranakan Usia. Then it's like Paranakan is um to explain to people who do not know uh basically Paranakan Chinese are the descendants of Chinese who have migrated to Southeast Asia from the 15th century onwards and they married local women like the Malays, like the Minangkabau, like the Bugis. So they have their own culture. The Peranakan Chinese have their own culture whereby they merge Chinese culture with Malay culture together. So their food is slightly different because I can say, I can't say I'm a Peranakan, but I married into a Peranakan family. So. Yes, you did. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Sorry. Like, so, that was so. I, I love, love it. that. I love that. <laughs> Keep that in. <laughs> <laughs> so the way we, well, how the Pranagans see things is they are Chinese, but they speak Malay. Mm. So for a uh, Pranagan Chinese to write Usia, and she, the, the writer actually interwoven Usia and el Pranagan elements into Usia. So this is what I'm seeing. You know, how they see Usia and everything coming together we inter we in a way we we perceive it to be and then we we will we work it into our being and the same one saying i'm just yeah no that it. makes sense <laughs> yeah yes and that was you, my spot <laughs> so, that sorry. was great uh, and <laughs> yeah. you, great timing what do, you, what do you think about like i guess wish i'm more in the west i guess yeah um so i haven't read too much um, in terms of wuxia being written in English, which I do feel like folks are mm. doing, and I'm excited mm. to do that. Um, mostly I haven't read just because I myself am interested in writing wuxia, and I'm trying to mm. stay away from works that are too similar to mine, um, so mm -hmm. that I don't get kind of influenced by them too much. Uh, but I know there are a lot of folks doing interesting work, and I think that's been something I've seen and I think that's part of that wave of kind of more interest in Wuxia in the West, along with mm. adaptations making their way onto Netflix, you know, mm. um, along with kind of translations of Jing Yong, translations of web novel, mm. translations mm. of like Modal Zusi, you know, into English and like fan translations and seeing mm. all of that. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I don't know in terms of kind of how that is impacting kind of creators back mm -hmm. in like um, places like China and Taiwan and Hong Kong because, mm -hmm. you know, are they actually paying attention to that reception or not? I think um, from what I know of kind of how it affected other genres like speculative fiction, like sci-fi and stuff, mm -hmm. is that people tend to be really excited that it's getting international attention just because mm -hmm. Um, having, you know, kind of international recognition is kind of very important and and just kind of make them feel like, you know, they're really a wider audience. Mm -hmm. But um, the language barrier is still like a significant factor. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of them are not really kind of paying attention to the reception and not really understanding the kind of dynamics mm -hmm. and kind of what and how we, you know, think about kind of representational issues is oftentimes mm -hmm. different from the source land, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think they're not necessarily kind of considering that, and I think they're just mm -hmm. kind of trying to write the stories that they're still they're still wanting to. And mm -hmm. I think there's some surprise because I oftentimes see a lot of discussion about, you know, is Wuxia really like translatable? You know, can people actually understand Wuxia when they're not Chinese? Can people, mm -hmm. you know? understand and appreciate wuxia when it's in english and and mm. it's a conversation that i see a lot mm. um in chinese media and kind of forums and circles mm. and and i wish kind of there would be more openness around that but i think mm. there's still kind of that association with kind of language and culture that people kind of really um feel attached to so mm. so i'm kind of yeah um so I think because of that, they're kind of not really thinking about kind of um, the reception and kind of letting it influence the creators. Because, you know, like for example, like Sanchi like didn't show in China. So like people didn't even, you know, watch that because they have completely different references 
than mm. I think we do. Um, but within Asia, like I'm really fascinated by mm. kind of the potential of what's going on outside of China, again, because mm. of the censorship. And because I think I do see a lot of people in the diaspora in Asia kind of doing different things that are really mm. interesting uh, yeah. with the genre. And I know when I was researching Jin Yong, he actually spent a part of his time in Singapore. Um, I was doing some research and they actually recovered one of his manuscripts, I think maybe for Xiao mm. Zhang Hu. Um, mm. And like a Singapore, like, like a like a newspaper office or something like that. Like they found it, mm. like the, the handwritten oh, yeah, manuscript yeah. and, you know, send yes. it to the museum in Hong Kong. Mm. So, so there's definitely kind of evidence of kind of ties that he had, mm. that he was writing mm. in Singapore, you know, some wuxia. Mm. I think mm. I think he wrote that specifically and released it in Singapore to help sell a newspaper he found it in Singapore. Mm. And it, because that's that's what he did. Like he started writing Wuxia in Hong Kong because he was like, you know, I, I found I found it a newspaper in Hong Kong. How am I gonna, you know, make people buy it? Like what are people gonna read? Wuxia. Let me write episodic Wuxia, you know, every week you have like one chapter. So you just subscribe now. You know, so so he did that same thing in Singapore. And um I remember doing that and I was actually trying to find out a little bit more about his time in Singapore. I couldn't yeah. find out too much. So maybe Joyce, you could help me in the future. But, I can just um, try it. I will look for it. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I was really intrigued by that because I think he lived there for a couple of years and I was kind of curious whether whether he kind of that influenced him and kind of how that. But, but yeah, I think that kind of explains also some of the reason why he is very popular um, outside of mm. China because of that. The connection. So, um, connection, yeah. A lot of Singaporean Chinese folks are really familiar with his work because of his mm. time there. Time, time there, and then it's the uh, his uh, his creative works is like Legends of Gondor Heroes, um, Sun Diao Xiangnu. Um, a lot of things are. It's big on mainstream media there in here, so we we have we have our local TV stations make remaking i think legends of condo heroes as well then we have hong kong legends of condo heroes we we have a lot of influence jing yong's like presence in singapore and it's it's i mean it's quite common but i'm not sure about the younger generation now but i think for gen Xers and earlier like boomers like gen, um my parents my parents generation they're quite big on jing yong and gulong so they, they read a lot a lot on it in Chinese, so it's like Mandarin Chinese. Yeah. Sorry. So, Steve, I'm curious mm. about what you think are like wuxia, from the little bit that, like from what we've talked about um, so far, like what do you think are um, wuxia like iterations in the West? Wuxia for me, and I don't know if anyone in the audience also feels this, but it is one of those things where I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I say that because there's no, I never had a formal, like, sit, sit down, watch this, wish a film. Like, that has never happened in my life. And I never think it will happen in my life. But there are very specific stories that I see where I'm like, oh, this is very separate than watching Avengers, right? Like, there's a very clear disconnect between, like, the kind of stories being told in this sphere versus this oh. sphere. And it turns oh. out that I grew up with a very small sphere of like what wuxia was and it oh. intersected a lot of different things. So that said, as I like got older and consumed more media, more texts and things like that, um, what I found was that in the West, many, many people misinterpret and that affected me, misinterpreted what wuxia is. And wuxia often became a shorthand for just being fucking Asian. Um, <laughs> and that was really mm. traumatic. Uh, mm. Because it really changed how, like, I perceive certain types of media. But now that I've kind of gone through and, like, paused and, you know, with the help of, you know, like, your talks on Asia Present and other things that happened prior to that, mm. I can now look at these and know more history. And I seek mm. out the history. And I want to know the context of why these stories are being told and why they keep resonating. Mm. And we've already talked about a lot of these things about kind of censorship um mm. queer representation and mm. whatnot 
So I'll start there. I'll move mm -hmm. into Dungeons and Dragons, which is obviously a very popular tabletop RPG, which yeah. in, in the core text says this game can tell a wuxia story you have an entire section in the core book that says wuxia and here it all is and it focuses purely on violence and revenge and yeah revenge is like a common theme mm. but just focusing on just those two elements i think is very disingenuous to the overall relevancy to bring back to the topic of mm. that genre it is very limited it's very scoped down and it's mm. kind of sad to see it that way because I see a lot of people, um, you know, in various D and D spaces that I'm in, where they will yeah. say, you know, I want to tell a wuxia story. So how can I make the action scenes really cool? And I'm like, that's definitely one aspect of it. But if that's the only aspect you're focusing on, I think you're actually cheating yourself. I think you are losing out on a lot of nuance and a lot of rich beauty that you could actually tell in your tabletop game. So that is kind yeah. of my negative interpretation mm. of how the West interprets Wuxia. Um, mm. But then, you know, with every negative, like I can find positives too. And I think when it comes to people being introduced to media like Shadow and Shang-Chi and things like that, I think mm. it's slowly opening it up. I think Shang-Chi has elements that I would mm. consider Wuxia, but it's still a Marvel movie. But hey, mm. not everyone can jump right into like a new genre and like resonate with it. Sometimes you need oh. a stepping stone. Yeah. Um, oh. And I think Shang-Chi is a great stepping stone for a lot of people in the West, at least. So my question is, oh. do we think that Avatar can count as a wuxia story? Oh. I mean, okay, let's talk. I mean, first of all, in terms of the, the moves, like the way that they fight, like those oh. are all modeled on real people doing martial arts right like so, martial arts and everything and yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. that aspect mm -hmm. the aesthetics of that part mm -hmm. maps on but mm -hmm. like because i when i think about like western iterations of it i don't know if mm -hmm. i'm always thinking about something that's completely one for one because like yulian said earlier like there's a lot of i mean there's a lot of discussion in China itself about like can you even tell a wuxia story outside of China you know like all that stuff but uh, mm -hmm. like what are some like like I'm thinking about just iterations of it like aspects that people latch on to obviously there are all of the um, like kind of when people th oftentimes people will think of kung fu movies uh, which is mm -hmm. very much just about that aesthetic part which is mm -hmm. like those kind of fights that are mm -hmm. very extravagant um mm -hmm. And just visual feasts, um, mm. and I I feel like that is the most direct way that um, aspects of wuxia has been interpreted in the West. Mm. But I'm also thinking about now like other parts of stories. Like I do think I think that Avatar can count as like an iteration, but I don't know what y what y'all think. I, I think, think yeah. go ahead oh, no go ahead yeah. so oh, polite okay. so polite no Joyce please I would be <laughs> I'd be happy if you went first <laughs> I think Avatar is can we see more like ciencia with if, if I'm I'm just guessing I mean they, I mean obviously is the all the fighting styles are based on the Wuxin with the five elements so it's very cultivation based. Right. Am I right? I mean, Eileen? I've seen bits of Avatar and I I feel like I would say it's influenced by. I think it's a lot of those yes. kind of yeah. Where it, it's, it's one of those I think in the in the gray zone where it, the line gets blurry. Because mm -hmm. I think I think there's a lot of I think both Steven and Negatha talked on this which is like i think when people think of wuxia they just think there was martial arts you know there was kung fu and this wuxia mm. but i think for me wuxia is really about the xia rather than the, xia. the wu which is martial arts mm -hmm. which xia is like the the vigilante hero so mm. so that would be my kind of zoning and on what some what makes something 
wuxia or not, is whether it has that kind of spirit, mm. even perhaps without martial arts. But if it was, you know, featuring this kind of figure who kind of stood mm. against, you know, mm. um, the government or institution or was kind of an underdog who kind of helped people mm. Um, mm. using their power, you know, I think it would have the spirit of a wuxia story. So, mm. so I would look at it from that angle and less mm. about the, the martial arts. Um, definitely, I think mm. the martial arts is like a aesthetic mm. um, that's really important and kind of what's really fun mm. about it. But like, yeah, so like, you know, how close do we get to that idea of the Sha? in an mm. avatar i don't i don't know so so that's where i think the line gets mm. very blurry um mm. and how you know how can you represent the idea of sha um in that kind of world where it's like this kind of you have you know different nations kind of with very different kind of mm. um setup as opposed mm. to like this kind of one world that's kind of like an alternate ancient china mm. So, so that's where it gets kind of challenging, I think, because you know, can we kind of map the idea of Sha into like, like a more um, multicultural or like a Western-based fantasy, or yeah. not? I think yeah. a lot about how like um, sometimes I would also read in my web novel reading um, like mm. stories that are labeled as Xi Huan. So that's specifically Xihuan. Western fantasy. Um, and it's okay. very interesting reading those stories because they're like, it's like the Chinese interpretation of like Western fantasy and like what kind of oh. things like, and it's also very much about the aesthetic, I think. Like there's always, mm-hmm. there's a lot of obsession with like knights and or um, like Templars, I feel like. And like oh, very place, yeah. classic kind of like those themes but reinterpreted in an almost like video game like way because i think that's probably where a lot of um ch- chinese readers or audiences or writers have encountered like mm. these themes and so i feel like it like sometimes i look at um chinese stories um that are labeled as wuxia or xianxia or etc and i think that they we we give them much more of a pass as long as they hit certain things because we already have a like kind yeah. of like an understanding of like that we all share the same knowledge base both the writer and the reader so then like certain things if they don't touch on them or if they're not necessarily ad- certain aspects if they're not addressed very well it's like it doesn't matter as much but then when you're reading something or consuming media from like a non Chinese um, perspective or creator, then it's kind of like, okay, but do you have all of the the bases covered first? And in a way, I think that is definitely legitimate. But I also think that sometimes, um, like so I think we were just much more um, intense about hitting all of the boxes uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to Western me- Western media, in which I think is fine because I think there's a lot of like association with like culture and identity Mm. like with the genre that Mm. is not necessarily in other genres so like I understand why we like can be more um, critical have a more critical eye I found Mm. that a lot of the wuxia type stories written by um, the diaspora within the Mm. west are actually all more like Xianxia or like mm. maybe some of them are like Xuanhuan, like sort of but there's definitely mm. always like a supernatural element to them which I find really mm. interesting but also like everything that I've read so far are within the young adult genre which is mm. I think it has its own kind of like um, like the publishers they have their own kind of st- standards or expectations when it comes to genre so like a lot of times like young adult stories like you're either in a contemporary story where there's probably going to be some kind of romance or something or or it's like one of those like serious young adult contemporary stories or if it's like it's like a genre 
book where it's like and genre Ooh. means that there's some sort of magic like there's a lot of young adult stories with magic in there so i wonder if that's kind of also why those are the ones that end up getting published where like these like young adult wuxia stories are more than wuxia and are kind of like xianxia-esque but not exactly because they don't cultivate but there is supernatural elements and like supernatural beasts mm-hmm. and things mm-hmm. like that so i think i'm finding it very interesting in terms of like what aspects are being chosen to talk about um and are being read by like a western mm-hmm. audience within this specific subgenre which is also why i wanted to ask you about it Yiling. yeah that's, that's so interesting yeah like i think I also do see it tends to in English it tends to be magical and it tends to be fantasy mm. and and I think it sometimes it comes down to just maybe different ways of seeing genre because because like I was saying like fantasy as a concept as a particular genre didn't really the genre label didn't really exist obviously we had fantastical mm. and speculative works mm. like all the time mm. um, but but that wasn't really like a category um, consciously. Mm. And it was more like when it appeared in a bookstore as, you know, this was a fantasy section. A lot of it mm. was kind of Western fantasy being translated mm. into Chinese. Mm. And now suddenly like we have a fantasy genre. And, mm. and in the West, you know, that's kind of, people are writing fantasy. And then they're mm. seeing, you know, Wuxia as kind of within that fantasy genre, which it is speculative, but, but mm. Wuxia doesn't need to have magic. You know, or yeah. or it's kind of a different view yeah. of kind of, of magic, right? Like yeah. it's kind of like these the martial arts. You know, it is defying gravity and stuff, but it is kind of it's, it. I think it's kind of pushing the boundaries of what humans can do. You know, there's kind of this belief that it's a little bit like historical fiction in some way, but mm-hmm. kind of just kind of legends. You mm-hmm. know, it's it's kind of like if you have something like you know set in the wild wit wild west. Mm-hmm. You know, with these legends, like it's it's not necessarily like magical um so so it's kind of interesting that um the magic has kind of been maybe played out more or is this more present yeah in the yeah. in the english yeah yeah and i think just yeah like as an aesthetic like it makes sense um but i would personally be more interested in also seeing like the other dimensions of the genre mm. kind of also being present um, if if people are interested in kind of exploring that more, um, because I think that would be like super kind of fascinating. I my mind is buzzing now because you've planted this idea of like the West Wild West aesthetic in the West with like wuxia themes and just like mm-hmm. how those could marry up. I'm like, mm-hmm. I think that would actually be really really cool. I think there's so much opportunity there because. I love the Wild West aesthetic. I love mm-hmm. the the gunslingers riding on horseback. I love the mm-hmm. dusty plains, but also I love drama, right? I love to see how people <laughs> yeah. interact with each other and yeah. and talk about it. Um, there is a great episode. I wouldn't. I don't know if I would call it a uh, like how much it is wuxia. Like I couldn't give it a percentage. But there's an episode of Warrior where. Um, to uh, the two main characters who are Asian, they're Chinese immigrants. Uh, they mm-hmm. transport, they have to transport a, a casket to finally give this person like final resting. They're given this mm-hmm. job and their car, uh, their carriage breaks down and they're trapped here in this middle of nowhere place with all these other people who don't speak Chinese and they pretend they don't speak English <laughs> and they sit there and they, they eat and they find out that the chef is also a Chinese immigrant and the chef comes out and he's like, I made you something from like, my hometown uh and they have like a really good bonding session there and they understand about this the complexity and like how people just like make a living and then Mm -hmm. bandits show up and the bandits are like we're gonna kill everyone here unless you give us all your money and right before then the two main characters find out that the casket that they were told is a body that they're transporting for like religious purposes it's actually full of money and they're they're smuggling and they didn't know and like that drama there. And of course it ends with a big firefight and also a little bit of martial arts. Like sometimes the guns run out of bullets and all you got to do <laughs> is you have your hand ax or maybe some fists. And it's great because the entire bar sets on fire, right? Like it's very like action oriented, 
but it builds up to that. And I just think there's a lot of opportunity for like these, these very classic Western aesthetics mm -hmm. and these very classic non-Western elements to be Oops. married together to build something that I think is greater than the sum of its parts. Nice. Yeah. So um, I've also talked about this in the past, but Gu Long, like this really well-known Taiwanese Wuxia author, he was, he was directly influenced by Westerns. So, you know, he, yeah. he watched, you know, a lot of the classic Westerns, um, spaghetti Westerns especially. And, yeah. and, you know, those being influenced by like samurai films. So, yeah. So we have some kind of intermingling of influence and mm. and we see that kind of I think that's where like we see more of the value system or like the character relationships mm -hmm. or conflicts or kind of character tropes mm -hmm. of kind of the Wild West setting and the characters that we might see there, like you know, the mm -hmm. lone travelers that kind of the way that they kind of you know seek revenge and the values and kind of how they're kind mm -hmm. of outsiders of society, like we see those kinds of things. Mm. in wuxia in like a very different mm. aesthetics but mm. but it's kind of some obviously there's you know culturally specific values as well but but mm. i think we have a little bit more of that kind of deeper layer in those mm. kinds of um stories or maybe we see it also like you know in superhero films or we see it in kind of films that kind of challenge i think again kind of the government or we have kind of um, kind of characters like standing up and kind of helping the kind of marginalized and people who need support. Mm. So, so like those kind of, yeah, like going back to near the beginning when we were talking about, you know, the what makes the a Xia, right? Like, it's the Xia. The yeah. cowboy is a Xia. Is the cowboy a Xia? Is the knight a Xia? Because I, I, the, 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 sometimes people think, even I write, I wrote in Hats of Wulin that the closest thing you can approximation to English translation to a Xia is a knight, mm. like an English German knight, you know, knighthood with the, the ideas of chivalry and everything, but close but not close. Yeah. But it's the but, idea that they, yeah. they, they, yeah. Sorry, they uphold good. things like honor, like loyalty. Yeah. They, they watch over the, they protect the vulnerable, the marginalized. So is the cowboy a Sia? Is the knight a Sia? What is a Sia? I mean, what defines a Sia? I love that because, you know, the classic Arthurian legend of, mm. you know, King Arthur, who is born mm. for greatness, and mm. Lancelot, who is gifted greatness, and the tension they have in their romance with mm. Guinevere. Uh, sorry, mm. the name escaped me for a little bit. Uh, yeah, very dramatic. And I, I have never heard of a knight potentially being potentially like a Sha. That is, that's mind blowing to me. That's like. <sighs> we see some of the same values in terms of, you know, kind of mm. the gentleman like quality. But, but the Sha is yeah. the creation of this kind of particular social class as well. And that's mm. where, where I think it differs from mm. like a traditional Sha. Because mm. because we have this kind of, you know, Sha as like someone who is, you know, from nobility and who's kind of trained mm. and who's on horseback. And we had those mm. associations as well. Oh, you mean for knights? Year? Or so, yeah, yeah, with, for knight with knights. Yeah. Right. And and we don't and Sha, I think I see that as kind of different in yeah. that regard. Even though we have kind of similar codes of conduct, I think. Mm. Um I, I yeah like i feel like it's a little bit more robin hood esque kind of yeah, compared to um a knight but but it's maybe mm -hmm. the the melting of those two you know mm -hmm. um yeah yeah and we did actually have some definitions of sha that was created mm -hmm. you know by like early um writers mm -hmm. of, of philosophy who created the term sha mm -hmm. before like Wuxia, yeah. you know came to yeah. be and and they're mm -hmm. They say things like, you know, like Sha is someone who used like, you know, physical force to fight against, mm. you know, like to, to fight for justice, you know, yeah. and kind of do what's kind of um, to carry out kind of justice when kind of mm. things um, like the greater powers fail kind of. Mm. So, so um, yeah, and we see things like, you know, they live in the world of Xianghu, which is kind mm. of the, the kind of 
I don't know, like the martial arts kind of world. That's Community kind of like outside of wilderness. Yeah, kind of the wilderness <laughs> and the streets. It's kind of outside mm-hmm. of you know the the big cities mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the the court, the temples, kind of the mm-hmm. the systems of power. Yeah, so it's kind of mm-hmm. opposing that. So you so it's like the the underdogs and the the people, the warriors of like the Jiangsu mm-hmm. space. You know, so mm-hmm. yeah. So that that kind of brings me, I think we're also coming up to time, but I would love to hear about what your own writings or like what your own foci, wow, I wrote that, Uh, (laughs) what, like, what do you want to focus on when it comes, or what have you felt more drawn to when it comes to Wuxia? Like, what draws you to the genre and what kind of stories do you want to tell? I think we have a little bit of the idea an idea with what you've been saying, Eileen, right? Like you want to talk mm. about more of the Xia aspect um, mm. and less of the like, maybe those magical aspects, or like mm. what we said earlier about the YA um, kind mm. of manifestations of Wuxia, mm. Xinxia, things like that. Mm. I okay. Um, well, for me, I kind of am drawn to things like family, clan, lo- loyalty, which is, Wuxia is also big about like family, your fang hai, your sect. So mm-hmm. it's like, how loyal are you to your sect? Or how loyal to, are you, so are you torn between your sect or your other relationships, like your potential loved one? No. And how, I want, I like to write about things where protagonists have to navigate between you know, personal motivations and then, against the larger familiar clan uh, obligations, because I think a lot of Wuxia talks about the very Chinese concept of obligation. You're obligated to your family, you're obligated to your, to your teacher, you're obligated to your, maybe to your Lord who's protecting you. So it's so many levels of obligations and you have only one person you yourself to take care of and it's like you have to fight off all these desires and higher motivations and still keep to the goal of being a Xia. And right now, I mean, for me, with the current technology we are given, why not we can just stretch Wuxia and have everything inside Wuxia fantasy historical. I mean, right now we have we are seeing a lot of novels with historical slash Usia Sensia things like Iron Widow, uh she she who became the sun. Um all these are in a way right on the historical slash Usia slash C drama kind of preferences we have now, I mean, we are so drawn to it. Um, for me personally, I want to write stories where <laughs> there's a lot of food. <laughs> because China, for some strange reason, food is very big in Xia and Xianxia. I don't understand why. Maybe Chinese, <laughs> we eat a lot. Uh, <laughs> but besides fighting for the fighting for the vulnerable, I want to see more compassion and kindness and being aware of people around us. I mean, it's like, um, yes, you have power. Yes, you you have cultivated this powerful, like, golden core within you. But what can you do? The only thing that maybe the bravest thing you can do is your love, your, your loved one, protect your parents. And this is the bravest thing you can do. I mean... The current thing I'm working on is is a serial, uh, serial uh, episodic uh, thing I'm posting on Wattpad, and it's based on the twelve uh, zodiac uh, Chinese zodiac animals. So there are twelve shifter clans who are cultivating twelve disciplines, and uh, main protect protagonist is a non-binary femme rabbit. So she. They have she or they have to fight against their own personal motivations and fight against a villain. So I mean, I'm still writing it too. So. Oh my gosh, what is it called? 
it's called 12, uh, 12 Paths to Glory. I'm writing it with two, attaching uh, with uh, RPG thing attached to it. I, I came up with the whole story idea plus RPG game mechanics. You know, so. God. What? <laughs> Wow. Wow. That's, that's so cool that's so cool <laughs> yes i wrote it in pandemic pandemic year one um, also we had lockdown in singapore as well what, so i had what a I, mood I, I, the, yeah that, that was a mood i was like i was like going after this i'm gonna write happy <laughs> so yeah nice yeah how about Elian? yeah let's see um I'm working on, I'm the, in the early stages of working on a novel, so it's going to take a while, and I'm not really ready to talk about it yet, but um, I'm also writing some, some short stories as well, and I'm really interested in, in addition to what I already said about, I think, um, the kind of, and seeing more representation of the Sha in English, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm also just interested in picking up more of some of the, the historical roots that I've seen that have been lost um, mm. around, for example, um, like female characters and mm. interesting, complex, yeah. strong kind of um, feminist takes of mm. the genre that I see, like historically, actually a lot of interesting kind of um, Tan Daisy tales around mm. um, women Sha that mm. I think people don't really know as much about as I would like. And mm. we maybe have the one or two stories that's been kind of adapted and retold and then mm. everything else has been forgotten. Some interesting kind of doing retellings and picking up on some of that um, from the perspective of the diaspora. And um, I'm interested also in kind of melding genres because I have a, a loose understand or loose view of what Wuxia can be. And I'm more interested in the in the kind of philosophy and the, the deeper aesthetic or deeper kind of, um, I, I guess, philosophical and like social critique and other conversations in the genre as opposed to just the, the, the aesthetics. Although I think that's also really fun as well. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm kind of trying to borrow that into stories that I'm writing that are not necessarily straight up wuxia. So I've written, for example, like um, a, I would say kind of very near future, like very faintly sci-fi story um, that had some qualities of like a wuxia. Um, it's on Clark's World if people want to read it. It's called Sparrow, and it had Sparrow. and it has um, it has references to like a sha. You'll see it mm -hmm. when you read it. Nice. Um, I, I have written, you know, like a story uh, where it's like a VR game set in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, a, it's like a Wuxia VR game that exists. Mm. It's kind of like a multiplayer um, MMO kind of RPG um, mm. kind of setup uh, based mm. on some inspired a little bit by my experience playing Wuxia games. Um, and, I, and, you know, it's kind of this, um, I'm trying to imagine, you know, like can Wuxia exist in the future or like can what would Wuxia look like in like a sci-fi setting if, if that's a thing more possible. Um, so, so I'm kind of interested in kind of exploring kind of angles of the genre that haven't been explored before. Mm. Um, and, and one day I would love to write also as well maybe for games. Um, in terms of, I don't know what that would, would look like, but um, mm. I'm really fascinated by that as well because mm. uh, I, I have done some homebrew um, like wuxia games that I have DM for sure. friends. So, so I'm friends. like, you know, uh. so that I think that would be uh, really interesting to see in either like TTRPGs or, mm. or in like, um, in just um, like computer games as well. Mm. Um, yeah, and and I would love to translate, um, and I would love to see especially more maybe dame and that kind of stuff um, mm. being translated. So, yeah, that's kind of. I think we should collaborate on something called a dame visual novel or something. <laughs> we I just we just need to find an artist. Oh, I, can't, I can't draw to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we definitely would need an artist. I'm not someone who, yeah, especially <laughs> someone who knows, like, who can do the aesthetics very well. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. 
So that is super awesome. Um, I think, yeah. Okay. So we are coming up to time. Thank you both so much um, for yeah. uh, popping on. You, if you could grab me the link for uh, the story, I think of Sparrow, um, that we can link sure. to people in the chat, but we'll also provide it uh, afterwards um, to our audio. But I want to, uh, where, if people want to follow you, read more of what you've written, and then just see your updates. Like, where can they find you, Joyce? Uh, you can find me at on the third tweet, but you can find me at Jolantru, which is Jolantru. I'm I gonna type it on because it's yeah, easier it's, to that the Twitter handle is yeah. under uh, Joyce's. Yeah, uh, it's Jolantru. It's a Star Trek reference. J O L, uh, J O L A N T R U. It's actually Romulan greeting, <laughs> I, because I like the Romulans. Um, you can find me at uh, a wolf's tail. Uh, it's basically a wolf's tail at wordpress.com. So it's like I have my list of works there, plus I will update my blog once in a while on, on what I'm. I'm writing and what I have I've published. So at the moment I am writing, um, I can't say much, but a DCC um, something, dungeon Ooh. crossing. Yeah. Very yeah, cool. It's, uh, it's also distracting me. It's, it's a good helpful distraction from whatever's happening outside now. It's just helping me focus and not think of daily case counts. Singapore is weird. Singapore news is weird. So I am tired. <laughs> Eileen, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm on I'm on Twitter um, at Eileen Writer. So Y I L I N W R I T E R. Um, I'm also on my website as well, just like eileenwan.com. Um, I have a page called Literary Jianghu, which is um, I post some of my thoughts and also short translations um, mm -hmm. of, of like wuxia related um, mm -hmm. research that I've done, um, especially around kind of the history of the genre and mm -hmm. um, and kind of the early folk tales and kind of adjacent mm -hmm. um, kind of discussions um, related to to um, wuxia and xianxia. Mm -hmm. And um, I also have an article out recently um, in the bulletin uh, mm -hmm. on the history of the genre, which um, is currently available to read um, to SEPA members. And, mm -hmm. um, and after the exclusivity period passes, um, I'll probably find a place to po post it so that more folks can, can read it. So be on the lookout for that. It is a great article, a great primer. Uh, yeah, to it's genre. good. So, um, but like all of this could not have happened uh, without our wonderful patrons. So, Steve, I'm going to change. Yeah. Back. So, hey, everyone, this is Steve chiming in here to kind of bring us out to the close here. I'm bringing in Marla. Uh, so here's Marla. Uh, so, oh, Marla's upset. Marla's, Marla's really angry. Um, <laughs> but for... <laughs> For our patrons out there who support us, we really do appreciate all the support you have. Uh, so special thanks to our Guardians of the Realm, Brooke Bright, Pixel Grotto, and Daisy May. And then, of course, huge, huge, oh, Marla, don't bite. Um, huge, huge thanks to our most honorable patrons. Can't believe I have to say that each time. Ryan, the Wizard Hall, Metal Weave Games, uh, Valor's Games, Dungeon Glitch Matt, and the most honorable times two, Epic Impulse. So uh, for all our patrons, uh, thank you so thank you so much. You gotta take Marla away from me. I'm so sorry. Uh, I also wanted to end off our stream by a really really quick update that uh, you know I, I want to let everyone know that we have brought on a new uh, crew member, uh, Drew, who will be helping us on our Discord. So as folks might know, we do have a Discord community, but that community is been closed off to new members. Uh, except for paid patrons. Uh, but with Drew coming on, we have some great, great plans coming up. So Drew is going to be our official Discord community manager. Uh, that means he's going to be helping to plan and implement growth in the server, uh, as well as, you know, 
taking in server feedback and making sure that we have good lines of communication. Really, really excited for that. And I know in the future that Drew is going to help us and enable us actually to open up those invites once again, so that we can have member, uh, we can have people from the outside community apply uh, and be part of our community, given some kind of process that's TBD, but something that we want to put a lot of care and thought into. In addition, Drew is also going to be heading up in the future, our ban appeal process as well. So we want to make sure that our community is safe and that we have proper processes in place that everyone can understand and respect uh, for everyone's benefit. But those are all the updates there. So all of our thanks to our patrons and especially Drew. Thank you so much for joining our team. We definitely look forward to continuing working with you. Also, you're fucking dope. So that's cool too. Uh, So what we're going to do is we're going to go and raid someone. I will figure this out. Uh, So (laughs) please do not leave yet. Uh, uh, But thank you all so much for joining us for this amazing episode of uh, Is Wusha Still Relevant? Which I think we've very much answered. Um, (laughs) um, so, So I will, I think this is our last uh, Asians represent episode of our season um, mm-hmm. but you can find all of this on our our podcast feed so mm-hmm. no worries about that and we will be back better bigger and better than before stronger mm-hmm. faster stronger, harder faster harder <laughs> yes thank you this is <laughs> thank you, Steve, <laughs> for picking up what I'm putting down um, thank you all so much uh, we will see you Uh, we return.